This week on the Back Table Podcast. I think that the key thing always is collaborating, communicating, always. I mean, that's mm-hmm. true for our whole lives, I guess. I mean, a lot of our problems would, would go away if we all communicated. But I do think that that's key to referring physicians, to your patients, to your colleagues, to your peers, to your techs, to your nurses, everything about it. If we communicate and we collaborate, then a lot of these other things come together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com, and pretty much any podcast platform out there. With over 500,000 patients treated globally, Impact Admiral Drug Coated Balloon is the market leading DCB for treatment of femoral popliteal disease. Learn more about how Impact Admiral DCB can affect re intervention rates for patients with PAD by visiting medtronic.com slash five-year DCB. This is Aaron Fritz as your host this week, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, Diane Keen. Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. You and I connected a while back, a couple of months ago, via Jason Levy, who's been on the show a few times, and we had a great conversation talking about marketing strategies and you know patient education and physician education. And um, having kind of gone through that, being out there on my own a little bit and trying to get in front of docs and trying to educate patients on what it is interventional radiology does, I thought this would be a a great episode to have you on um, since you've been successful over several years, uh, you know, helping interventional radiologists. A lot of years. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to give it a number, but I, I, you know, you're you're definitely seasoned in in helping out the interventional radiologists in this realm, and so. I thought this would be a great topic to cover. and uh, But before we jump into the meat of it, I just wanted you to kind of give our audience a little background about how you started working in IR and, and um, your background uh, in, in marketing. Okay, so original entry into radiology was in 2003. I joined a practice of about 25 radiologists. Um, this was, you know, in the early days of really marketing IR. A lot of people were not doing it. The whole world of radiology marketing was new. I was charged in this practice with both diagnostic and IR marketing. So their definition of a good day was to spend all day delivering pound cakes and referral pads for CT. And I quickly it's not a good thing. Um, I mean, it's good if you need to grow CT. It was not good for me because what I was seeing was IR and I was seeing um, Y90 was introduced in 2002. I started in radiology in 2003. So it was a really exciting time in IR. And yeah. I quickly learned that being in IR was so much more fun. I mean, I fell in love with interventional oncology and then UFE has kept me in love. So it has really been my focus. I love it. It's been, I know you're generous with not telling the years, but I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Wow. So yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah, it's okay. We all know that uh, CT is boring and marketing for CT is boring. <laughs> I can imagine, but it is something that people need. Um, and it is something that is part of, uh, you know, our practice, but it is a lot more exciting to go out there and kind of tell the cool things that IR does to the referring docs. It really is. And that actually brings up one point to be made is yes, we absolutely do need marketing professionals for CT and diagnostic modalities, but keep in mind that the person that is really great at marketing CT might not be the same person that understands interventional radiology and can really help you there. Oh, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's two different worlds and you, yes. you got to really know, you know, your product too. And so radiology is so diverse in what it offers now that uh, it would be nice, yeah, if somebody's marketing for interventional radiology that they know the ins and outs of interventional radiology. Uh, and we'll get into why that's important, you know, especially with referring docs and and really coming in with a specific message that they, you know, take home message for them. But uh, in, do you want to talk a little bit more about how you came to the practice where you're at? Yeah, so I was with the practice that I first joined for about eight years. Then I went into a practice that focused mostly on UFE, which I learned a lot. 
was great, but that led me to Northside. So Jason Levy stole me away about 10 years ago and quickly just jumped on board with Northside. It's a great practice. So it's been a really good place to grow IR business in a world that understands and accepts IR. So it's been really good. I have really been able to focus on oncology programs. Our hospital system has a huge oncology presence, one of the top rated community hospitals for oncology in the country. So that's helped us tremendously. And we're also known historically as a baby factory. We deliver more babies than any other hospital in the country. Oh, wow. So that gives us a huge GYN base. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a good spot to be for interventional. You know, I was going to talk a little bit about how difficult it is to uh, market for endometriology because the lay public and a lot of physicians, you know, don't really know much about it. Did you want to talk about the trifecta first? Yes, thank okay. you. So I often speak on this subject, and whenever I do, I like to refer to this whole idea of practice growth for radiology, interventional radiology, being like a trifecta. I call it the IR trifecta. So there's three components. One, you, the interventional radiologist who can be the IR champion, if you will, that's not afraid to do the extra work, that wants to communicate, collaborate, grow the business, and is willing to get out there and do it. A lot of people say they want it, but they're not ready to do it. So that's one part. The second part of that is your infrastructure. How is your clinic set up? How is that managed? How many people do you have working for you? Are you hospital-based? And this really, this trifecta idea applies across the board, whether you're hospital, academic, outpatient, OBL, it really kind of all applies. So the second phase being operations, and there's several things within the operational part of this that are hugely, obviously important. But here's one that is interesting that I think a lot of people don't always think about. And that is from an operational perspective, knowing your phone number. That sounds ridiculous, but I've seen a lot of times where people have tried to do a marketing campaign, initiated something and used a phone number that they've used forever or that they got off a referral pad. And it's, a bad number. It is a number that a patient might call and get a scheduling department or a call center for your hospital. I've seen it happen again and again. And I would encourage everybody secret shop your phone number, make sure that the person answering those calls knows what you're doing, knows who you are, preferably works for you. But if not, make sure that they are well trained in what you're doing and the type of person who might be calling. So yeah, I would challenge everybody to secret shop your phone number and see what you get. Or better yet, have someone you trust do it. I was going to say, is it best to do it yourself? No. Or yeah. <laughs> Get someone to do it for you and give yeah. them just enough information so that they're not asking the right questions. Yeah. So maybe like your significant other who knows enough about you and what you do to call in yeah, and exactly. yeah, exactly. Be, that's a great idea. I didn't even, yeah, I haven't thought about that. You know, this is when this occurred to me the most. When I first joined the group, there was a phone number on brochures that had been the nurse's station when they first started the clinic. Yeah. So everything they had was still using that number. Wow. Well, at some point, it got transferred to the hospital scheduling right. group, just the outpatient scheduling. We did a big event. A patient called, and she called the number on that brochure. This is when I, I mean, literally had been there a week. I don't take any responsibility for this. I take responsibility for fixing it. But this patient called the number that we gave her and she got pulled into a call pool in a call center. And it was about UFE. She understood her problem. She didn't quite understand IR or the hospital system in terms of getting in for this appointment. And she got someone on the phone who was nice to her. She was upset. She had heard this talk we did and was very impassioned to finally do something about her problem. And all she said was, I went to a talk. I'm interested in the procedure that's going to take care of my 
my bleeding, my periods are bad. Well, she's saying that to a call center mm -hmm. and no one knew what she needed. And they said, ma'am, I think you probably need to hang up and call a gynecologist. So mm -hmm. that happens. Secret shop your phone number. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good advice. Yeah. It sounds so simple, but it gets, it's wrong a lot of times. Just real quick on that uh, secret shop, your number, because it, it might not even be the person that answers it. It might even be the, the answering mach the message, right? Because sometimes it's somebody who I, I discovered this on a prior um, practice where I called in and nobody answered. And it was the message of like the accountant had done the message. And I was just like, why is he doing the message? He does not sound passionate or welcoming or any the energy was not there it needs to be somebody who sound that you actually want to talk to on the other yes. you know and so i think the message uh if it's a voicemail should also be well put together absolutely yeah anything anything you do that represents you right. but you're right the voicemail is something again often overlooked so yeah what's the third part that's me <laughs> so practice development and marketing and having a good strategic plan, a growth strategy, someone that can help you with this. I mean, we all know that you're really good at what you do, but sometimes you might not know what you don't know when it comes to marketing, when it comes to growth and having someone, a person, an agency, whoever that might be is very important. And I think it's important to establish what you need when you're working with someone or you're thinking of hiring someone to help you decide what parts of, I put this in air quotes, marketing that you want. Marketing really is, that's about the creation of collateral branding content. When we use that term as a broad term to say radiology marketing, but actually the person you need probably isn't just going to be creating a brand for you or creating, helping you create content for a brochure. They're going to be your liaison. They're going to be speaking to other physicians on your behalf. They're going to be representing you in the community, in your hospital system with referring physicians. So choose wisely. Um, if you can get someone who really understands what you're doing, understands interventional radiology, someone that you can invest some time into their interventional education, make sure they know it, let them shadow you as long as it takes. If you have someone like that, someone who you can truly trust to speak on your behalf, it will take a lot of the load off because this can be overwhelming. And it's a lot of it involves things that you really might think you know, but having help from someone who actually does it or has done it can be very crucial. So that's the trifecta. It's you, it's your clinic, and it's me. Yeah, and I think the last one's a key uh, key point in that education of the marketing person. If they don't, if they're not familiar with interventional radiology, I think a mistake that I made previously was not training up that person, just assuming they knew what they were doing, and then realizing, you know, months down the road that they didn't really know the the what I did, uh, and it would have been nice. I should have taken the time to have them, you know, shadow me and watch some procedures and see me in clinic and get an idea of, you know, what, what does a venous ablation mean? What does that do? You know, because I think she, uh, that person was probably out there struggling a bit, trying to answer questions from the referring docs. You know? And that's not unusual. So in my experience with some of the national organizations that help the business of radiology, I've met marketing professionals in radiology from all over the country. And I'm surprised at the number of practices and marketing specialists who really don't understand interventional. So I think that's why things like this are so important and being able to have a, a method or a platform to share these things. It's very important. This is great that you're doing this, that we're talking about this, because I really think that learning what you don't know and learning what your really good diagnostic marketing person doesn't know about IR is crucial. Uh, we've got in our system, we've got several radiology marketing reps who their job is really to go out. They're the people in the field that are knocking on doors for general diagnostic, putting out the fires. But inevitably, you've got physicians who start asking them IR questions and it's a deer in the headlights. They don't right. know how to answer those questions. Even though they've been with me, I've taught them, I've worked with them for a long time. 
it terrifies them. So truly having someone with the confidence to help you is important. So in your practice, do you have a separate, because you're, because it's, you're, it's a big diagnostic and IR group. Do you have separate radiology marketers for general radiology and then separate IR marketers just for IR? Is that the way it's set up? It's not set up only because I don't have control of that part. Yeah. So this is a hospital based and they're hospital employees. Right now it's um, separated by geography. So okay. it's such a wide market. So it's really geographic based on the location of our diagnostic centers. We work with all of them to understand a little bit about IR, but when they get those questions, they pull me in. Yeah. Typically, if they if they have questions, they call me and then I can go over and make a very specific, very targeted visit. That's right. not wasting their time or my time. Yeah. Well, this is a great segue into the the next the big question that I have. It's to me, always the elephant in the room is, is, you know, IR is still, and it's like very frustrating for me. And I know for a lot of docs is that IR is still not a well-known specialty, not just amongst lay people, but uh, amongst the public, but amongst physicians, you know, general practitioners, you know, especially people in the outpatient setting, you know, a lot of IR, you know, a lot of inpatient physicians are familiar with IR, you know, because we work closely with GI, we work closely with you know, the hospitalists, they usually tend to know what we do, but the outpatient docs, you know, they're, they're not used to interacting with us. And so they know what a vascular surgeon does. They know what a cardiologist does. But, you know, when you say interventional radiology and you start listing all the procedures that we do, their eyes kind of glaze over and they don't really take, take away much. So I, what I want to ask, you know, from a marketing perspective, what strategies work best to kind of overcome that both? And we can separate the answer into for the, for the docs and for the patients. Yeah, good question. And yes, this is the biggest hurdle. From a patient's perspective, you can understand it a little bit more while they might not know exactly what interventional means. But it is interesting that uh, so many specialists and so many general practitioners don't know I think that one of the things, this is somewhat going astray a little, I would love the idea of interventional radiology practices around the country somehow pooling resources and information to really create a national campaign that could focus on teaching the world what IR means. That'll take a lot of cooperation, and right. but it, it would be great. I think that it's well past its time. Yeah. But one of the things that when it comes to IR, I try to often replace the word marketing with education because there's always somewhat of a negative connotation about mark the word marketing. So if you think of it as educating and you trying to educate the referring community, sometimes it puts you in a different mindset. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things too is you have to consider how much time you want to spend trying to throw the whole menu of procedures at a general practitioner. Because what I've seen historically with GPs, not in a hospital system, but like the referrers in the communities, they love the idea of IR. Mm -hmm. They love the idea of UFE. They agree. They support it. They do well women's care. They have patients that could be referred. And at the end of the day, a lot of times they don't change their referral habits and they will still just mark the chart with see gynecology or refer to a gynecologist. So right. I think that I've tried for years. I've tried for at least 15 years to try to influence family practitioners, internists, and sometimes it just, it's not worth my time. I'm not saying they wouldn't have good referral base. And I think if you're doing veins or you're doing some of those procedures that are easily referred by a general practitioner, but for the most part, in terms of the most bang for your buck in your time, your effort in explaining what you do to the referring physicians is maybe really just focus on a specific specialty, focus on a couple of things that you could do for them and start there. Don't throw it all at them at once. Once right. they've sent you a couple of patients, you've taken care of them, you've communicated with them, they're not going to forget that and they will come back. Right. right. I think that um, there's a lot of what's in it for me. And yeah. that's us. That's the human nature. What can you do for me? Yeah. So a big part of going out, meeting with these physicians, calling them, talking to them, sending them information 
this might sting a bit, but they don't care who you are. They care how you can help them and what procedures you have are going to help their patients. That's all they care about. They might care about you after the fact, but that introduction is what can you do for me? So be very succinct, make it work, give them very specific information and develop the relationship next. Prove yourself with a couple of procedures, a couple of phone calls. And it tends to turn around pretty quickly when you've made an impact on someone. But I would say definitely put your effort in the specialist if your time is limited, if your funds are limited for marketing, because you will see results a lot faster. Yeah, those are all very good points. And, um, you know, Trini Tumla, he's uh, down at University of Miami. He was on the show not too long ago saying a lot of the same thing where docs just want you to solve their problem. It, you might you, you might as well think of them as your patient, really, and because they're an extension of your patient. And if you're if you make your patient happy, your referring doc's going to be happy. And you know, going in there and saying, "Look, this this is what I specialize in. If you have a patient with leg swelling, I will figure out what the answer is, and I will treat them when necessary." You know, and just focusing on that. And then next time, you know, and then you start getting their their vein patients. And then next time, you might go in and say, "You know what?" I'm also really good at treating patients with fibroids and, right, uh, and we'll have that discussion down the road and kind of going, you know, stepwise baby steps, you know, to get, to get more and more of their referrals. And it's just a matter of gaining their trust, you know, one at a time, not trying to bombard them with everything that you do. You yeah. Know? Agreed. And I think it's hard. There's a, f- there's a fine balance between being the expert and sharing your expertise and coming across as, a car salesman. You don't want to feel like you're selling yourself, pushing your seizures to the point of, you know, it, it it can cross that line. And for some people that is off putting, I think some referring physicians don't want to see that again, they don't care who you are. They want to know what you can do for them. So, and that overflows into the patient communication as well. So with a patient campaign, when you're trying to educate patients or market to patients, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. They have a problem. You can solve it. Yeah. Acknowledge their problem. Tell them how you can fix it. And then everything else is built around that. But it's the same thing, whether it's physician or patient. What's the problem? What's your solution? And if you can provide that in the first minute of your conversation, the first few seconds of a visual campaign, whether it's social media post or brochure, capture their attention, speak to the heart of their problem, and they react to that, almost a visceral reaction, depending on what specific procedure you may be. I did this a lot with the fibroid patients. One of the things I often see when physicians are attempting to market themselves is what looks like a yearbook photo, a list of your credentials, and maybe on the back of the last page, a little list of what you do. Again, that's not going to get their attention. No one wants that. No one cares. And for example, with, with my fibroid campaigns. One of the things I learned early on was I spent a lot of time with women with fibroids, whether it was at health fairs, community health talks, any opportunity I could to either shadow the interventional radiologist or get out into the community to meet these women. I really had a chance to feel their pain, to truly see what their lives were like with fibroids and how they had to live with it. And that really influenced what I did as an outreach opportunity. So I created the campaign of a lot of times when you see my fibroid brochures or ads or anything, and I teach this to other people. So you'll see it now. I see it across the country, but really focusing on the color white. I often use the image of a big, white, beautiful, fluffy, comfortable bed with nice white linens Hmm. because you or I, we would look at that and think, wow, sweet dreams. I like that. But what's your fibroid patient going to see? Blood. Blood. Well, exactly. So instead of sweet dreams, that (laughs) would really be a nightmare. Right. They can't have that. That will get their attention. That image on your brochure, for example, will get their attention. Yeah. 
it's something they can't have, but they want it, and you ah, can give it to them. It's a very that's you're, pretty... you're speaking truly to the heart of their problem. Yeah, that's some psychological chess you're playing right there. That's well, for, you I have like... to do that. I mean, if you really want to stand apart and you really want to impart to that patient or that clinician that you truly get it and you understand and you're here to help them, meaning the clinician, the patient, yeah. fix their problem, then that is 75% yeah. of your effort right, right. there. It right. makes the rest of selling, if you will, the procedure or the yeah. program easy. Right. All right. Well, that's that's really uh, interesting. So since we were also on the topic of uh, you know, referring physicians, I wanted to find out, especially in the times of COVID where you can't just do your clinic visits and, you know, and, and check in and talk to your docs and stuff like that. And also docs aren't going out and whining and dining each other anymore. You know, that yeah. sort of thing has gone by the wayside. What are, what are the strategies these days in terms of getting to know, really it's, it's all about forming relationships and getting to know those referring docs so that they know that they, tr you know, establishing that trust, whether or not you've, they've sent you patients or not, or, you know, you know, or if you live in a competitive town like Atlanta or Dallas, you know that other docs are trying to wine and dine them. What are some effective right. strategies to get to know your docs and, and really form those relationships? So, the, you know, that's very practice dependent. Like you said, yeah. in a large town with competition, it can be difficult. Um, in a small town or even some of the hospital-based groups, you know them by proximity. They're there. Mm -hmm. They're going to know you. But where it's competitive or say you've opened your own OBL and it's down the street from a hospital with established IRs, people know them, people know their names. How do you overcome that? How do right. you get to know? So let's speak to, from that perspective a moment. True. Because you don't have the opportunity necessarily to pop in on the tumor boards or the case conferences that you might if you were in a hospital setting. Many right. people do. And if you can and you have access to that, that is always a number one opportunity is to be at the table on a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. Never miss that opportunity. I and mean, that sounds obvious, but it's a big one. And then I think that we have used Zoom quite a bit. I've done a lot of CME meetings via Zoom. Mm. I know we're all a little bit Zoomed out at this point, but yeah. it's helpful. And I've seen almost a bigger audience for some talks because it is Zoom, because people can get to it and they're not making a big effort to reach you. And the power of a CME credit can go a long way. Sometimes right. that if you have an opportunity or the ability to get a talk credentialed for CME, do it. That, that's been very successful for me. We do that quite a bit. We did one. And, you know, think about it when you try to plan something like that. For example, the last one I did for gynecologist. Of course, I want to grow our fibroid business even more. But the topic was hemorrhagic emergencies because that's not threatening, right? Because you know, once you yeah. get to the Q&A, it's going to turn into fibroids. You will be talking about it. Right. But start with something that they need. What's yeah. in it for them? How are you going to treat hemorrhagic emergencies? Again, maybe not so much in the outpatient lab, right. but right. hospital base. But the point being, start with what you can do for them. Yeah. And then yeah. go, you know, tread lightly into here's what we want. This is what we really want to work with you on. Right. So that's a big thing. And it, it is hard. I think that probably in a competitive town, that's one of truly the hardest thing. But I think, estab again, establishing yourself as an expert, me finding one champion in each specialty sometimes. Don't try to know them all. Find one. Right. Get to know them well, and the others will come around. People talk. They share experiences. They yeah. share good outcomes. So focus on the one person or the one practice that you have access to and start there. Don't try yeah. to get it all at once. And I think right. that that could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Um, sometimes you'll go, you walk into an office and you'll get the cold shoulder from a couple of the practitioners, but then one person's willing to sit and talk to you and yeah, don't worry about those other ones. You know, Absolutely. like you said, or you, if you can just get one of them on your side, then chance, you know, they're partners. So chances are they'll, they'll help you in the long run if you're providing good service. You Absolutely. Know? And never underestimate the value of those um, mid-levels. Yeah, right. 
the yeah, APPs they- in the practice. So we do, one of the things we do is even when we can't get to all the oncologists all the time that we want to, once a year, we do a dinner. Now this was prior to COVID. So hopefully maybe we'll do that again one day, but for just the nurse practitioners and the PAs for the oncology practice and really focusing on them, focusing on educating them on the same thing that you educate their physicians on has really been a big thing for us. And that goes across, it can be GYN PAs and nurse practitioners, even mid-levels and focusing your attention on them can really help you. They're seeing sometimes just as many patients. They're just as involved in the process. And sometimes they're a lot more likely to kind of get it and to understand that IR and a less invasive opportunity is really good for their patients. So yeah, for sure. Um, real quick on the along that same lines is is cell phones, you know, giving out your cell phone number because I think you really literally should give it out to any anybody. I mean nurse practitioners, PAs especially because they're the ones on the front lines and they usually have the questions for you, the important questions about like, can you do this? You know, and uh, I think that's really important to give your cell phone out to anybody who asks in the practice, even if they don't ask, just like, hey, take my number. If it's a question about a procedure, even a question about imaging, I'll help you out. You know, absolutely. Share that number with everybody. But only share it if you're willing to answer it. Yeah. So yeah, I've, right? I've heard That's physicians true. that, um, you know, brag about giving their cell number to everyone, even their patients, but yeah. then they don't answer it. So right. what, what good point? is that? That's right. worse than never give it to That them. makes them more frustrated. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah, so, for sure. But yes, absolutely. Or have a method for, you know, maybe a call center. If you have a person, someone that can help you answer those calls right. and maybe you're in a case, but they can take that call for you, get right back to the referring physician, that helps. But just having a way that they can access you whenever yeah. is is very key. And cell phones go a long way. Texting goes a long way. If you yeah. have someone's cell phone number, they have yours, a quick text, obviously not with patient information specifically, but for those questions, that's been a big tool too for us. Yeah, I've heard some docs say, you know, they'll let their patients know uh, or even, a you know, a referring doc know, hey, look, I may not answer the phone, but I will text you back, you know, because yes. I have a family and I can't just jump on the phone, but I can text you back, you know, and and answer your question. You know, and that, I think that goes a long way, too. Yep. It um, does. And usually it's reciprocated. I know there are some people that guard their cell phones, but... I think today, especially because we've gotten away from any other sort of beeper or instant connection, that it's pretty widely accepted that you just share cell numbers. Yeah. Uh, Let's turn back to the patient-directed marketing strategies. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, the hurdle of, you know, patients not really knowing about image radiology. Do you recommend getting the word out uh, um, with like TV appearances, radio ads, billboards? What's your take on you know, those kinds of resources. So if you're on a TV show as a guest expert to add value to maybe your program, but definitely to interventional as a whole, absolutely. We need everyone to do that as often as we can. We need to share that message. But if your appearance is self-serving or you just want to be on TV to talk about how great you are, I don't know that that really helps you. And I think it can backfire. I think it there's a fine line between promoting the procedure, promoting what you can do to help a patient, and then simply promoting yourself. So right. be judicious, but on a good, reputable platform, absolutely. Okay. And yeah, you know, like you said, the, all that stuff's very expensive, Billboards are very expensive. Um, radio is very, I mean, you know, I've looked into all those things in the past. And to me, the best value for your buck, and actually uh, it was Aaron Shiloh that taught me this a long time ago, is using social media. Absolutely. Today it's critical. You can't not use it. Yeah. And it makes the whole world at your fingertips and you're not investing very much money. So yeah, it's huge. I think that, we can talk about this for a long time, but I know we're limited in time. So we were, this will kind of be an overview. Yeah. But um, I had a conversation about two or three weeks ago with one of the national social media gurus who is tremendously helpful. And it's interesting because 
that day, Instagram was the most effective tool for reaching a consumer audience. That still stands. It's interesting, though, that there's an algorithm. We all hear about that. We all know that happens. We see how we get targeted. But within the algorithm of Instagram, in this moment, this could change next week. It often does. Right. There is a there's a balance of the posts that you put on a grid, the Insta stories, and now IGTV, that the more you do each of those, according to whatever that algorithm may need that day, it will also increase your appearance on Google searches. Mm. So it's a good thing to do. Be careful, though, because you need to do it right. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time. It could be a whole job, an entire person's job in itself. Um, I would say don't be afraid to outsource that. There are several marketing agencies around the country that really understand radiology marketing and really understand IR that can do this for you, that can work with you to develop a schedule of outreach. You know, you can add things in between, do what you want, but it really helps keep your feed relevant, fresh, content coming. Because if you don't fill that space, someone will. If you don't put your message there, it will be someone else's. So I think Instagram, still Facebook some, although that's losing right. a lot of users. I, they're migrating away from Facebook. YouTube videos, that's a big thing. And especially mm -hmm. now with the advances in our iPhones, just the ability to film with good sound and good video, making videos that are short, tours of your facility, quick questions, information on specific procedures. I mean, you can create a YouTube channel. And it's another very inexpensive way to reach those patients. And you can cross reference, you know, that your YouTube for more information, put that on your Instagram. I think also we laugh at this because it became such a crutch to so many people during quarantine is TikTok. And you don't have to be a TikTok dancer to find value in putting your message on TikTok. That is where the people are now. Wow. And there are certainly ways to go into that world without it being a joke or without it being a dance or the yeah. funny people who are trying to be TikTok famous. You really can spread good messages. There are several professionals I follow on TikTok just dermatologist and other yeah. sorts of, I mean, that real solid medical help or advice. So don't yeah. be afraid of TikTok, um, YouTube, Facebook still. I would say Twitter is a great way to reach the professional audience, maybe right. your peer to peer, your colleagues, post interesting cases, journal article recommendations. Know that patients will see your Twitter and your physicians will see your Instagram. So don't think it's exclusive. But as far as where you're putting your efforts into social media, I would say definitely use Twitter first if you want to share cases yeah. or connect with peers, show your expertise, highlight your expertise. And then when you're reaching patients, again, think about what we talked about earlier, about ways that you can really speak to the patient and under, let them know that you understand what they're going through. And social media is is perfect for that. But again, don't be afraid to outsource. It can be very intimidating. Yeah. And if you don't have the time or the wherewithal to just make that happen, really consider outsourcing. I would say that's true with several components of IR marketing. Most people can't do it all. We would like to think we can. I think I can do it all, but no one can. And it's hard. You're not going to find one person that can do everything for you. Find what you need most, outsource the rest, especially um, social media. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, Twitter for me is very user-friendly and I finally figured it out. <laughs> and I, everybody, all our listeners know that, you know, we use Twitter uh, a good amount for Backtable for getting the word out on new episodes and stuff. And same with LinkedIn, because I find LinkedIn and, and Twitter to be very much peer to peer yes. uh, for physicians. There's a great, especially IR community, but there's a great end of us community on Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, Instagram to me is a whole different animal. And thankfully, we I, I have uh, Ann and Chi Dang that help us with Instagram. And um, maybe it's a generational thing. But I just, you know, it, to me, it's just it's just tougher to kind of figure out how to get in front of your target audience, and that might be because you know we we are peer to peer um, in in at back table. But you're right. What I see the the physicians I follow, it's all very patient directed education, you know. Right. 
And so um, I, I totally agree, with, like just in terms of the trends that I see. Now, TikTok to me is a whole different level that I don't get. I don't, I mean, I, to me, it's entertainment, but I don't, I haven't yet to figure out how it can be educational. Um, and so it'd be interesting, like if you, could, you know, it's had suggestions on docs that, that, you know, people could follow on TikTok uh, just to get a taste of that, you know? Off the top of my head, I probably yeah. could not tell you. I'm happy to look later and share with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we can some, add that later. Some are funny still, even though right. it's good information, but you don't have to be. I mean, it really is just legit patient information yeah. or peer-to-peer -peer information. Yeah. I think that this is a perfect example of saying, you know, you really do need that third leg of the trifecta. You need someone who knows how to right. do this, how yes. to do these other things. It's equally as important. And it's time consuming. It's, yes. I mean, you don't want to be on your phone all the time posting all this stuff. It is time consuming. So it is very helpful to have someone who can do that for you. I, so, you know, we're, we're about 50 minutes in. Wow. I, I want to ask you, I know, it's, I know that you went can fast. talk so much. Any other pearls of wisdom for the young IRs starting their own practices or those in big groups looking to stand out and grow a new service line? Oh, yes, lots. A few things that come to mind are just repeats of what we've said earlier in this talk. And that is, remember the trifecta, invest in marketing. It's important. I would say we typically say for marketing budgets, and again, this is could be a whole different talk, but one to three percent of gross revenue. But if you're yeah. launching a new line or a new service or a new OBL, seven to eight percent of expected gross income revenue. And okay. it it's a lot when you're starting, but it's worth the investment. Another thing to keep in mind about that and about budget and about investment is you don't always see an instant return yeah. and understand that going in that sometimes these relationships take a long time to build and you've got to put that upfront money and effort into that before you will ever see returns. Um, the second thing is really don't be afraid to outsource, but make sure if you outsource, you trust the person, the vendor that you're working with Trust that it's someone who does understand interventional, but know also that you're, you still will be actively involved and you still have ultimate control. You just have someone helping you with it. I think that the key thing always is collaborating, communicating, always. I mean, that's mm -hmm. true for our whole lives, I guess. I mean, a lot of our problems would, would go away if we all communicated. But I do think that that's key to your referring physicians, to your patients, to your colleagues, to your peers, to your techs, to your nurses, everything about it. If we communicate and we collaborate, then a lot of these other things come together. If you're doing a community health talk, for example, I've often included a gynecologist, which sounds counterintuitive to talking about UFE and some markets it might be, but you're creating a team. You're creating a unit that works together. I've seen this happen before, and I would one thing I would warn you against is if you get patients from both physicians and from the community, be very careful about your message. And if your message to the community, to the women's groups that you're talking to, basically says your gynecologist is lying to you, you really should be having UFE, it's your only option, you can bet that those gynecologists hear that messaging as well, even though you think no, that's for the consumer. They won't see it. They're consumers. They see it. And creating a divisive message will not help. It will, you will lose the referring physicians. And then you'll yeah. be very dependent on TV appearances or weekend health fairs or all the things you need to do to really drive consumers. Because yeah. creating a divisive message will cut those referring physician referrals off really quick. Um, again, secret shop, your phone number. I could say that all day. You think I'm kidding. Do it. No, <laughs> I was going to say the, the divisive messaging. I've seen people do that on social media and I, I think it's meant to be patient directed, but it, to me, it doesn't appear wise because yeah, a ref, whether a referring doc in that town is going to see it, or maybe a referring doc elsewhere, somebody's going to see it. And it's just not a positive message. No, you know? absolutely. You need to put that, a pot, like you said, a positive collaborative message out there. Yes, you know? for sure. Yeah. And it never should, you should never grow your business at the expense of your competition either. You know, be, I am very careful to talk about our expertise, talk about the, our IR physicians and our program and the good things about that, but never take that 
opportunity to bash your competition, even right. if you're way better than them, just be above board on that. And that will help. But definitely the divisive messaging is bad. <laughs> it will hurt you in the long run. So yeah. two more things, I think maybe always be conscious of the laws related to medical marketing. Start. Okay anti-kickback, sunshine, all the things related to how you can and cannot spend money on marketing efforts for physicians. If you mm -hmm. need to bring in an attorney to con consult with before you ever start this, I would recommend it. I meet with Stark attorneys at least once a year to just remind myself what we're doing, what we can do. Sometimes there's a certain cap on the amount of money you can spend per physician per year okay. in a marketing effort that changes huh. sometimes from year to year. So so find out from the experts how not to mess up and do that from the beginning and do it often. Remind yourself yeah. often. And we were going to do an episode on that soon too. Yes, I, good. I yeah. think I think that's fantastic. It very, very helpful. And then I think one other thing we can talk about too is most of the IR community are members of SIR. Yeah. Most. So there is a toolkit for marketing on the SIR website. And I helped them create it. We put it together. It really is a presentation similar to what we've talked about today, but a few more details on some things. So find that, check that out. That can hopefully be helpful okay. as well. So I think that in a nutshell, that is yeah. a start. Yeah, no, I think we covered a good amount there. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And, you know, maybe, again, maybe you know, uh, obviously there's a lot more to delve into. So maybe if you'd be willing, uh, we'd have you on again to even take a deeper dive into some of these strategies. Because I, I, I know there's a lot that we didn't get to, and it's oh, hard absolutely. to cover in an hour. This was very much broad strokes yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> right. a very hot overview. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love to come back. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to of our course. listeners for, for listening. Um, as mentioned before, you can find all our episodes episodes on backtable.com, Spotify, Apple, uh, Stitcher, basically any podcast platform out there. Uh, thanks again, Diane. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.